Hey guys, Chad Hoover, Kayak Bassin TV, and it is fish quiz follow-up time. So, a week or so ago, I posted the video about solunar influence, solunar data, and basically the effect of the solunar uh, influence on our ability as fishermen to catch uh, fish or to uh, make better presentations, you know, what have you. Uh, great response. Thanks to everybody out there for the awesome comments. Uh, the interaction i'm really digging the interaction that's the that's the best part about this whole thing is not just you commenting on the videos and asking me questions but actually reinforcing each other by commenting on the comments of other folks uh both positive negative uh, i appreciate everybody keeping it clean uh, great healthy discussions make us all smarter i learn a lot every time i put up one of these videos so let me get into soul lunar as i see it um for years, I thought it was kind of quacky. I didn't know that was necessarily true uh, or that it was accurate. But I'm a big-time hunter myself. Uh, not only do I fish, but I also hunt. And the more that I started researching this concept for, um, for hunting and the more that I confirmed in, it, in my mind that it was an actual uh, influence and that it really did have an effect, I decided to explore more on how it affected fishing. And so when you look at deer, just to pick a game animal, and how they are influenced by soul lunar data, it's because they're a herding animal. And so, you know, your lion or your tiger or your wolf or your predator, uh, us, uh, are not going to be as affected as much by the soul lunar data, uh, soul lunar influence, soul lunar times, because I think more important than anything else is the understanding that it's the prey uh, that is affected, the herding animal. Well, fishermen don't have herding animals. We have schooling animals, and those schooling animals are bait fish. And so uh, if you've ever out, been out watching the water when you're fishing, if you've been watching Nervous Water, uh, I want you to do this drill for me so that you can prove this whole concept to yourself. When you see birds like egrets and cranes and herons up in the trees uh, with their head tucked in, uh, write it down. And then go back and verify that that is off peak. In other words, it's not a peak feeding time. When you see no surface activity on the water, no V wakes going along, no fish popping on the top, uh, no fish swimming, no fish making wakes and blowing things up, then mark that on your uh, little notebook, put it in your notepad, uh, write it on a piece of paper, do whatever. And I want you to do that for about a week and then go back and look those times up. I want you to look up the times when things weren't active. Then I want you to look up the times when you see the cranes and the heron, you know, walking along, creeping through the shallows, poking at fish, grabbing bait fish. Uh, I want you to, to mark down the times that you see the V wakes and you see the, the shad and the nervous water on the top and the heron schooling. And I want you to uh, log it when you see a topwater explosion or bass chasing schooling fish. And I want you to go verify that that was in the feeding time. So what you're going to find is that by and large, everything's alive uh, during the peak periods that are called out by these solar lunar tables. Uh, for a better understanding, these tables are really vector uh, charts. Their vector is an angle. And what those charts are is they are representing the moon's relationship to the earth and then the sun and the moon's relationship to the earth. So the moon effect, in my opinion, the solar uh, effect is not quite as much as the lunar effect, but when you take the two together and you align them and you get that so lunar effect, then it's it's a very strong uh, influence. So when you see that the fish are active, it'll be during a peak feeding time. If it's ever outside of that, there'll be some external influence, barometric pressure dropping, signalizing a front coming, barometric pressure rising, symbolizing you know that uh, that a front has become stationary. All of these different things are going to let these animals know. They're going to be cues to these animals that they need to feed ahead of time because, you know, it's like you, whether you're hungry or not, when it's only 45 minutes so the restaurant closes, but you're sort of hungry, you're going to go ahead and rush over there and eat. Uh, animals are going to do the same thing uh, if a front's approaching because for them, that's the restaurant closing. Um, so, but, but here's the thing that I find is the biggest mistake in using this data. Uh, as I know fishermen that, that look at the charts and go, well, the chart says the fishing is supposed to be good at three. I can't go to five, and it'll be over by then. And that's not true. The best time to go fishing is when you can, you know. Um, uh, fish when you could instead of when you should if only time you can fish is when you could. 
But here's what you got to keep in mind. When you are fishing off peak periods, slow it down. Uh, fish a, 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 a tight to cover presentation, a slow moving jig, uh, a worm, a creature bait, something that you're going to let sit in the strike zone, something you're going to move slowly, something that's going to contact the cover. And then during your power fishing periods, uh, when you're at your peak periods, when the world's alive, that's when you're using your crankbaits, your shallow, or your shallow cranks, your spinner baits, uh, your fast moving plastics, your swim baits, you know, things that have to be chased down. Uh, if you've ever seen Mutual Omaha or one of these movies where, you know, the gazelles are standing 50 yards from the lines and they've laid up swatting flies with their tail and they're just standing there and they're getting away with it. And then two hours later, the lines are out there creeping around and they're chasing the gazelles for everything that they're worth. <laughs> That's kind of the demonstration of what I'm talking about. And so bass are the same way. Sometimes they're just laid up next to the tree. Now, don't get me wrong. If that shad in this scenario, the gazelle, wanders too close, it's going to get eaten because everything in nature is opportunistic feeders if they have to be because they eat for survival. Uh, but they're not necessarily going to chase it down. That gazelle uh, is safe as long as it maintains its distance. Uh, I think it's like God's time out that says, hey, time out for a minute. And then once it starts going again, that conveyor belt's going and everything in nature comes alive. The prey become uh, part of the conveyor belt. The predators stage themselves along the way to intercept that, that particular conveyor belt. So when you look at so lunar influence, I really want you to study it for yourself. I don't want to come out here and just vet out a bunch of information. But understand that the vector tables are based on four major things. And that vector is the relationship of the angle of the moon to the Earth's surface overhead, at moon set, underfoot, and at moon rise. And so if you think about it like that, you don't necessarily have to have a great app like Scout Look or a feeding tables chart from your local uh, website that provides that for you. Um, you can really figure a lot of this stuff out on your own. When you see the moon rise and you know it's moon rise, uh, when you see the activity on the surface, you know that a feeding period has to be in effect. So vary up your presentation. Uh, go power fishing when it looks like things are alive. Go finesse when it looks like things are, uh, are, are dead. And then in the transition periods, fish your slower moving crankbaits. Fish your, your, your slower moving spinnerbaits. Uh, one of the things that I do quite a bit is... I'll either switch from a willow leaf uh, to an Indiana blade, I'll switch from a willow leaf to a Colorado blade, or I will take the willow leaf and flatten the blade out, which gets rid of the concave, makes the arc wider. I can take that same blade, reel it a lot slower, I've got a lot of flash and a lot of thump because the blade is now flat and has a much wider arc and a lot more thump through the water and just keeps the bait in the strike zone a little bit longer. That's a trick I use during the transition when they're sort of still active, but not quite you know, full on like they were. And that is all just taking visual cues from what's going on out there. Uh, if you see a, a heron standing on the shoreline, he's not in the tree roosting, he doesn't have his head tucked in and one foot tucked up and he's time out, but he's not out there actively creeping along in the shallows ready to grab something. So those are all visual cues that let you know kind of where you're at. Seeing the moon overhead lets you know it's the primary feeding time. That's probably when you're going to see your most activity. Seeing the moon about to set lets you know that, you know, 10, 15 degrees above the horizon, that's a feeding time. And it's going to be that way for another hour or, or so after the moon sets. And then you just kind of have to know and understand that that's six and a half hours later, it's going to be underfoot and you're going to have another feeding time. But for me, I use Scout Look Weather. Scout Look Weather uh, and the Scout Look app allow me to have everything in the palm of my hand, my weather, my, and then that way I can provide the relationship. I can look up the area. I've also got my aerial photography uh, and, and, and imagery uh, combined with uh, easy to use tables that provide me all the information that I need for making um, decisions for my presentations and where I'm going to fish. Uh, if you've got a big open flat with a lot of stumps in it, uh, that's probably not the time to go fish your best power fishing presentation unless they're going to stage there all, you know, all day long. Sometimes they're, they're going to run the ditches chasing shad and then they're going to move up into the stumps to, you know, hang out like the big lion in the grass. But that's a great time to drag a jig along or work a creature bait through there real slow. Or when it first starts to pick back up, Throw a buzz bait across the top of that stump field, and you're going to get those opportunistic feeders before they move back off into the ditches and channels and move into chase mode. So 
understanding where you're at in those transitions. You know, power fishing dead center. As you're towards the end, start to do that that a uh, hybrid presentation, that slower moving but not quite, you know, pinpoint. And then as you get in your off peak period, use your pinpoint presentations, your uh, your jigs, your creature baits, your plastics that st your worms that stay in one place. Something that you don't move very far. Uh, the action is imparted by the lure sitting still and moving around in the water, resulting from the action that you implied that you applied before, but not necessarily from you reeling or moving your rod tip. Uh, and you're going to get you're going to get that localized bite where that fish is just right there, tight to cover. And so again, don't not go fishing because it's not the peak period, and don't dismiss the fact that during the peak periods or the transitional periods, you can really be in the right place at the right time and catch. 10 times as many fish as you normally do. Being aware of these things, understanding these things are all part of how I plan my trips. I'll talk about that more in my pre-trip planning and how I use the solar lunar influence to decide when to be where, uh, but that's a whole topic in, in and of itself. Uh, I really wanted to answer this fish quest question about my opinion on the solar lunar influence. I believe in it. Uh, I swear by it. I use it to uh, as, a, as a methodology for my approach to fishing. Um, it's always proven uh, successful for me, and I think if you take some time to understand what the vectors are, uh, what that relationship is to the fish, and when they're strongest throughout the month, you know, based on the sun and moon's relation, and when they're weakest, you'll understand what that fair, good, poor, and all of those things mean uh, that these websites automatically assign to it. And then you'll understand when other variables like weather phenomena, uh, preceding fronts, you know, uh, you know, fronts that are moving away, things along those late nature stall fronts and how those interact with the solar lunar influence to change the way, not that you catch fish or not the ability to catch fish, but how you catch them, whether that's through finesse, a power fishing presentation, a hybrid presentation, uh, or a flat out, you know, um, uh, aggressive presentation, you know, that's covering water and searching for these active fish. And so again, Definitely spend some time understanding what the vector tables mean. Uh, download a great app like Scout Look or, or whatever one that you can find for yourself that's going to help you manage your time. Uh, and then slowly but surely start to affirm this to yourself so that you can make it part of your game plan. You can be in the right place at the right time to catch more fish. So do me a favor, comment below. This has been a fish quiz follow up to my question on Solunar Data. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, do me a favor, like I said, give me a thumbs up if you like it. As always, please subscribe so we can keep bringing you great content. And comment below if there's something that I missed that you'd like to know more about the solar lunar influence and how it affects or could affect your fishing success. I'm Chad Hoover, Kayak Bass and TV. Thanks for all the great support, and uh, I'll be right back with another video here in a couple of days.